Okay. Thank you all so much for tuning in today. I'm so excited to dive into this office hours, both to learn all about how to create a best-selling memoir and also because a core goal of Dreamers and Doers is to amplify you and your journeys. And one of the ways we achieve this is by facilitating game-changing educational events such as this one that give us all the opportunity to up-level together. So before we officially begin, I want to share a bit of background information on our esteemed expert. Natasha is an award-winning Wall Street Journal best-selling author. She is the founder and CEO of Entire Productions, an event and entertainment production company based in the San Francisco Bay Area. Natasha is a classically trained violinist and celebrated jazz vocalist. She is a graduate of the Goldman Sachs 10K Small business program and has studied entrepreneurship at Harvard and MIT. Natasha is a three-time in a row Inc. 5000 honoree for having one of the fastest growing businesses in the U.S. Natasha is also an advocate for homeless youth, youth programs and a proud mother of her daughter Bennett and lives in Oakland, California. So with that, I will hand it over to you, Natasha. We are so excited to learn from your expertise today. We know how valuable your time is, and we're so grateful to you for investing in the collective in this way. My sincere pleasure, and this is a passion that I developed um, over the last five years, and I'm so thankful to be able to share my experience and my knowledge. And I'm going to go fast on some of the slides, and we'll slow it down for some of them. But I'm going to be talking to you about how you can more easily write the story of your life figure out the best publishing option for you, this book at this time, regardless of what you've published in the past or not, and regardless of how you'll publish in the future, and then also figure out how to make it into a bestseller. And I teach a course called Memoir Sherpa, which we really do a deep dive in. So some of this um, content is from there. So you are very capable, despite your fears and potential imposter syndrome, uh, to be an author. You, and it's very likely you can become a best-selling author and you'll learn later um, what that means. You can bring new ideas, comfort, and inspiration to your readers that need to hear your story. And the question for you to decide is, is that time for you now? So uh, if you stay to the end, or if you're watching this video and you email me, I'm going to send you this really incredible interview I did with Jamie Blaine, who's actually the co-writer and um, editor of my book, who works for HarperCollins, which is one of the big four traditional publishers, and then also a discovery prompt workshop uh, worksheet, which will really help you get started with the, the feeling of writing the book, the why, the how, and all of that. Um, If you could do all this stuff, that would be awesome so that I have your undivided attention. It's really for you. I was actually listening to an office hours that Geshe sent me this morning while I was getting ready. And I was so mad at myself for listening to it while I was like putting on makeup and doing my hair because I should have been taking notes and I should not have been distracted because it was so good. And it was from the grant writer. Um, If you want to know what it was, I'll I'll explain to you later. Okay, so we're going to do this right now. If you're an eye closer, close your eyes. And if you're not, don't. And think of the top three things that have happened in your life that are amazing and successful inflection points. Remember how you felt, where you were, who you were with. And We're gonna do one more uh, visualization and then I'm gonna ask you to grab a pen and uh, paper or type however it is that you'd like to note this down. So the next thing I'd like you to do is think of the three of the lowest times in your life. Even things that you may not have ever admitted out loud to yourself, to your friends and family, to your therapist, to your best friend. And how did you rebound from those times? Did you learn something important? Did it push you to be a better place in life? So those top three things and those bottom three things are actually very important to writing the story of your life and and a memoir and becoming a best-selling author and helping your readers. So these may end up in your book, 
be chapters on their own, or one of them might be your main topic or core message of your entire book. You do not have to decide that this moment. But if you've done any of these things, both thinking of it and then noting it down, you've officially started the process of writing your memoir. It's really that simple. So it's time to celebrate the potential, right? So you're in the right place today. You have so many things that you can do um, in learning and you chose to be here for a certain reason, but you may have always thought or have been told you should write the story of your life. Oh my gosh. Or you've always wanted to publish a book and become an author. Or you know that a publishing book, publishing a book will put you on the map and raise your authority and make you more significant in the business that you're in. But you can also help other people, which I found to be an incredible asset to writing a book. So answer in the chat, if you can, which of these three resonates with you the most? Have you always been told you've got to write a book about your life? Have you just always wanted to become an author? Or do you want to raise your profile and understand the power of what being an author is? And if you participate, you'll make me feel really good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Adelaida, I like your um, emoji. Good. So think about those things as we go along with this. So whatever your motivation is, I don't care if it is that you want to become a famous author and make billions of dollars. Fine with me. You don't have to be humble about it. Um, I don't care if it needs to be just a legacy piece to put your stamp of what you've done on this world into the world, you know, people don't throw away books. It's kind of like not okay. They'll sell them, they'll leave them in a free library box, but your legacy will leave on. So whatever your reason is, it's totally cool. So I did have that incredibly long bio that I probably submitted, which was a little embarrassing, but also I was so proud of it. But I want you to know, I'm just a regular old girl from Des Moines, Iowa. I live in Oakland. I love being in the water. I love kayaking. I have a 27 year old daughter, Bennett, who is amazing. She's a much better writer than I could ever think about being. She has a rescue dog named Bug, which means I have a rescue dog named Bug when she needs me to take care of her. And then I have two cats, Delilah and Ophelia, which I like to call Squeaky and the Destroyer. And I really wanna write a children's book uh, with them as characters with my daughter. But she's telling me, mom, it's not that easy, so whatever. But I just wanna to stress to you that I am a regular old girl, not from a wealthy family, not with an advantage. Um, so um, my book, Relentless, Homeless Teen to Achieving the Entrepreneur Dream was number one on barnesandnoble.com for a whole day, just one day. Number one on over 10 Amazon categories. I spent four years uh, from the day I met Sarah to the day it was published to write. I, I learned how to write, publish, and market a book. And I turned over all the stones in this antiquated industry so you don't have to run through the gauntlet yourself. I've interviewed literary agents. I've had two myself. I know so much about traditional and hybrid publishers as well as professional and self-publishing. My book has received eight literary awards so far, and it was published in March. And you know the rest about the entrepreneurship. So this is me trying to prove to you that I actually know what I'm talking about. So instead of frustration, I actually found an incredible passion in learning this new industry. And I learned what the best publishing choice was for me. I made myself crazy trying to figure this out. I started out thinking I had to have a traditional publishing deal. Otherwise I wasn't legitimate. Otherwise, I wouldn't land on bestseller lists, otherwise, dot, dot, dot. And I did not choose uh, traditional publishing. I will let you know how I did that later. And then I, I figured out the right pieces of a marketing plan by overdoing it, quite honestly. <laughs> and I actually teach a marketing module, <laughs> which really should be a standalone program because it's 22 lessons. <laughs> so I talk about everything that I did to publish, uh, to market my book. And then I also say what really worked, what didn't work at all, which 
like what I wish I hadn't done and what I am still trying to figure out if it's working because marketing your book is a very long-term process. So can you imagine what it would feel like if you're a best-selling author of your memoir, if you receive feedback that you inspired and changed people's lives, it's amazing. If readers consistently can explain, exclaim, like I tried to put down the book, I had to go to bed, but I just couldn't. Like it is so gratifying. So can you imagine what that feels like? Now, when I'm asked those questions, my reaction is, yeah, no, I can't actually. <laughs> so just absorb my exuberance. It feels amazing. So here's another one. Can you imagine what it would feel like to be on the top number one book selling lists when you are think, thought of as, as more of a thought leader and authority, um, either in what you are an expert in or just in life? And then you're a featured guest on media interviews and podcasts, and you're spreading your information all around the world. Um, the fun fact, I did over 100 podcast interviews. I do not suggest that in like three months. So it can also be cathartic, lead to hidden secrets and discoveries. Let me tell you the things that I discovered, I can't even. Most of them are in the book, but I found out things about my life, me, and some of the protagonists and antagonists in my book months after the book was published. Like the doors of the closet that were sealed shut are flying open. It is not for the faint of heart, but it's a great way to leave your legacy also for people to read and get to know you and the lessons long after you're gone, which I don't like to think about. So this is where we're going. Um, secrets of a successful memoir, myths of publishing, master marketing strategies, how you can work with me. Um, we can do a Q&A before the how to work with me. That will be short. So what is the most crucial point or lesson or message of your story? If you don't know it now, just keep this in mind as you think about your memoir. You might be writing this book for yourself and or your business. And I'll say, I started out writing my memoir really for me to have a cathartic experience. It was definitely ego driven. And then at some point I realized that this could be a very valuable asset to somebody else to read. But you're gonna see this, you're gonna hear this as you start to write your book from book experts, no one cares about your book. I about fell over when I first heard that. It is not fun to hear that what they really care about is what your book can do for them. So you have to turn around your story and think, okay, you have to split yourself in two. This is for me, but how can this relate to or help somebody else? And that will help your writing a lot. These are some of the things that make a book impossible to put down. Irresistible hook points, beautiful prose, edge of seat scenes, so suspense, tug at the heartstrings, vulnerability. This is so key. I put things in my book that <laughs> when my brother read it, he was like, yeah, really good book, Tosh. I don't know if I would have put everything you did in it, but good job. <laughs> Truth and, hum and being humble. So you may be thinking, I'm not a writer. I can't write um add copy i can't write an email to say i can't write a blog etc cetera, etc cetera. you actually don't need to be a, an amazing writer right now to be able to do this and there are lots of ways around this if you really do struggle with writing so i'd ask yourself the following and jot down thoughts and ideas that come to mind when you hear these what will your uh, readers glean from your story are you going to be able to make them laugh and cry what will what they're going through or have gone through be reflected in what you're writing and will they be inspired or motivated by what they read so these are really key things that you need to have baked into your book you don't have to be prescriptive my book is not prescriptive it's not a how-to book you do not have to have a pencil and paper out to get the value from it 
So we're going to talk about these. These are memoirs that are, in my opinion, well written, were hard to put down, and had messages that resonated with me. The first one was by a writer who wasn't famous before she published. Um, she published traditionally, but this is back in the day when um, the publishing industry had not been disrupt disrupted yet. So she didn't need what you now need to be a successful traditionally published author. Her name is Jeanette Walls. Uh, that's The Glass Castle. One was from someone who had a big following with a niche audience. And this one was hybrid published. Um, it's by David Goggins. And this is still number one on so many charts. And so is The Glass Castle. The Glass Castle was published maybe in the 90s. I think mid nineties. And then Glennon Doyle had a following via her blog and wrote her first memoir, Love Warrior, with a stunning follow-up called Untamed. I was just shocked after reading Love Warrior, what was in Untamed. And if any of you know who Glennon Doyle is, you know what I'm talking about. If you don't, read Love Warrior first and be prepared to be like, what the heck? Anyway, one thing in common that all three of these books have are family stories of adversity. That doesn't sound very sexy or exciting. And honestly, if I just said, well, this is a book of family adversity, you'd be like, maybe pass. <laughs> but truly, they were very well written books. So if you know this now, I would love to see it in the chat. What is one theme? that would summarize the story you'd want to tell. And you don't have to stick with this forever, but putting it down would be a good start. So put it in the chat, but also note it on your notes. I'll wait for at least one person to do it. Mm -hmm. You better make something up. <laughs> oh, Katarina. So I don't know you, Katarina, but thank you for posting that. And I'm actually working with a gal named Tiffany Yu, who has a nonprofit called Diverse Ability. And I think she's in this group, Dreamers and Doers, um, and amazing. Sydney, entrepreneurship, specifically failing and coming back yep motherhood and business oh sarah i don't even know I, everyone should read that book if they have more than one child in a business okay so um here's the deal let's talk about traditionally published books do you really need to be published by a traditional publisher do you really require the prestige that comes with the traditional publishing deal do you need an advance? Do you need to be paid upfront for your work? And are you okay with giving up your intellectual property? So if the answer is yes to most of these, then you should probably consider a traditional path. You also have to have a lot of followers and proof that you can sell through books. And it doesn't help. I mean, it helps if you're famous, honestly. But there's an interesting article in New York Times about Billie Eilish. She's hugely famous. And when she published a book, she didn't sell very many compared to how many followers she has. So these are the four um, big traditional houses. Penguin Random House is in the middle of trying to buy Simon & Schuster, but they're mired in some uh, legal action. Hachette Books, HarperCollins, and Macmillan. So um, the next thing is hybrid. It's similar to traditional publishing. A hybrid publisher produces a professional book, distributes it to multiple points of sale, just like traditional, and undertakes some of the marketing activities on behalf of the book, but not much. Do not get excited. Traditional and hybrid publishers are not going to make you a star. They're not going to invest in super amounts of publicity or marketing or social media. The author in a hybrid deal retains their intellectual property. And it's a reverse of the traditional deal. The author gets 50 to 85% of the royalties. Um, and the author has to do most of the heavy lifting, again, in all of the media. These publishers, um, they consider marketing 
because they'll say, oh yeah, we market our author's books. Of course we do. They're marketing it to get distribution and placement within brick and mortar in other places. That's their version of marketing, which is completely correct, but they're not doing outbound marketing. So in hybrid, the author is partnering more evenly with the hybrid publisher versus traditional. Um, and this is a partial list. I am not recommending any of these um, specifically, but if they're on this list, then they have a pretty good reputation. And then there's um, the third type of publishing is professional publishers, which is fairly new uh, to the landscape. So you would be published on their label and they do all of the work. It's basically a commodity. It's getting all the ISBN numbers, for you, the copyright, loading everything up, like taking care of the nitty gritty. They're basically work for hire. And the fees range from $6,000 to $25,000 or more, depending on the services they're providing. So I started, here's the spoiler alert. I started my own imprint and I am a, a professional publisher. I will publish my books under my imprint and those that come through my class, uh, Memoir Sherpa. Maybe if, if they want to publish professionally, if they want to publish with me, and if it's something that I feel good about putting my name on. Um, and they'll usually work with any author, regardless of the topic, even the quality of the work. Um, but they do have to make, they do curate a bit. So if somebody is so against like smoking, let's just say, uh, and you are writing a book on the glorification of smoking, they can say, yeah, sorry, it's not a fit. Then there's self-publishing. You won't have any label and you do most of the work in the layout and the design. You upload it to their site and publish as an ebook and print on demand. Um, they'll work with any author, regardless of topic, quality of work and cover. And believe me, there's some really ugly stuff up there and unedited and typos galore. So the three companies that are most known for doing this is Amazon KDP, Lulu and Ingram Spark. And I just wanted you to see what um, an Amazon listing for a self published book is. You see it says independently, independently published. It's not the end of the world. There are not a whole lot of people that are digging through your Amazon list to find out who published you. But the publishing industry knows, authors know, and entrepreneurs tend to get a little bit elitist, like, oh, who published your book? But truthfully, your readers do not know and they do not care. So you could self-publish a book that had impeccable editing and copy editing and punctuation and such great cover design, great layout, and it looks like a professional hybrid or traditional book and you'd be fine. But typically people choose this route because they're just writing kind of a business card book or they really don't have the funds and it's you know lower on the totem pole. So I'd love to know, based on what I just shared with you and what you knew before, what uh, publishing option would you choose today? You can just say traditional, hybrid, professional, or self. <laughs> Great, Lauren, traditional. Cool. So um, with traditional, you have to first land a literary agent for the most part. There are some traditional publishers that will take a query, not very many of them. You have to have a wildly large list and ability to sell through. Um, at least 10,000 books, which I'm going to tell you right now is challenging. And um, it'd be great if you were like an expert in your field. So I'd love to know, um, you know, if, if that felt good. Traditional, but, but for a nonfiction book. So memoirs are nonfiction. Um, they're, they're wrapped up in that, uh, Lauren. Okay. The time to start marketing your book is when you decide to write it. So you can take your community on a journey with you. You can tell them like where and when do you write, 
post it on social media, your emails, your newsletters in conversation, write a blog post or, or an email campaign, or even write an article for um, a newspaper or a magazine, and then invite your community to join you in the process. Then they're going to be more poised to want to buy your book at the end and share it with other people because they'll feel like they were part of the process. So I would start part putting your marketing plan, which will shift and, and, and shift shape over the course of the project. You need to start doing it as soon as you start writing. And think about what outcomes you want and what key um, KPIs or metrics that you want to look at, because you need to measure them to make sure that you know, the money, the time and energy you're spending on that marketing element has an ROI that you can define. So you could, it could be like, how many books will I sell by doing this one marketing thing? How many reviews will I get? How many emails will I get on my list? Or how many speaking engagements will I land? That kind of a thing. So here's something you can do. Create a document outlining each strategy. I had a 25 point monster master marketing plan. I do not suggest you do that. It nearly killed me. And then you can indicate when you're gonna start that initiative, the goal, the budget that you're going to apply to it and your desired outcomes. And then you need to note who is responsible for each strategy. Is it you? Is it your VA? Is it your fractional CMO? Is it a company that you're hired? And then revisit the plan and note the status every single week with a very tight agenda so things don't fall through the cracks. But guess what? They are gonna fall through the cracks. That's just how life works. But if you do this really tight agenda weekly, then fewer things will fall through the cracks. Um, and I'll answer questions after we're done because I see one for Lauren and I'd love to answer that. So Amazon allows you to select two categories when you publish a book, but you can ask them for eight more. And I'm gonna put this link so you don't have to type it out in the chat. This is where you ask them for more. So I use Publisher Rocket for category research. And I'd like to tell you because of the categories that we um, defined, I was number one in the following categories for various periods of time, motivation, entrepreneurs, women in business, memoir, inspiration, self-help, jazz musician biographies, and classical musicians. And I'm still today, so this is September, I released in March, I'm still number one throughout the day, every day on a couple of these. But I was also number one in at least three categories during pre-sale. And here's the secret, you guys. You can become an Amazon best-selling author by selling two to three books if you've chosen your subcategories well. So that's, you know, at the very beginning of this, I said you are very likely to be, become an author, right? You can do it. I know you can do it. And very likely to become a best-selling author. And if you think about it, you know, for me, I have this great, like, I'm so proud I was on the Wall Street Journal and USA Today bestseller list. Can you guys guess how many books in one week I had to sell to be on those lists? Put it in the chat. I'd love to see what you thought. I did not know before um, writing my book, figuring it out. One guess. Two. Well, that would make sense since I kind of teased that for Amazon. That is not so. So it is about 5,000. You have to sell 5,000 approximately. It depends on how many people right, are selling, how, how many other books are selling in your category. And you have to do that within one reporting week to be on the Wall Street Journal and USA Today bestseller. But here's the kicker. So I'm on both of those lists. I'm very proud of it. It's incrementally, it's increased my speaking fee and my value and my perception, but also people get it mixed up with the New York Times. So they're like, so Natasha, how does it feel to be a New York Times bestselling author? And I'm like, interesting, right? They, they just, 
um, transpose those. Same thing with the Inc. 5000. I've been on that list three times in a row, which is super cool. But then in interviews, people will say, oh, you've been on the Forbes. No, the Forbes list is for billionaires. So it does do well for um, authority or the looking of authority. So I'm going to just really briefly describe some of these marketing tactics. An advanced reader team is where you get a bunch of people, hopefully, to read your book in advance. Then they buy it during pre-sale for 99 cents. You have to set your ebook at 99 cents until the end of the first week of actual launch. The thing is that you want them to be able to write a review and post it on Amazon. So it's some work to do, and you can do it in a small way or you can blast it out, especially if you've a lot of followers. The next thing is an influencer campaign, which I did. I did it so over the top, um, but you can do it not as over the top and you get a list of at least 100 people that you think would have reach to the audience you want reading your book. That's important, right? So let's say I knew a famous astronomer or astrologist or anything that has nothing to do with what I'm doing. Even though they have 100,000 followers, that are like science nerds or astrology nerds, having them promote my book to their audience is probably not going to land too well. So anyway, you're going to ask them if they want to participate in this influencer campaign. And you can either give them just the book as a thank you, but I produced this influencer box that was gorgeous and very expensive. Honestly, um, I had a necklace created. I'm wearing it with my name, um, I'm sorry, with Relentless engraved in it with my um, handwriting um, and a bunch of other things. Um, I won't go too deep into that because it could be uh, too much. The other thing is a pre-order sale strategy. You don't need to do a pre-order, but it's a good way to stack all the sales. And what happens is on the day of your launch, then those pre-orders count as sales. So you can like front load with um, a small amount of sales to get onto those bestseller lists. You can do publicity either DIY or internally with your own team that you build, or you can hire a publicist, which is about three to $12,000 a month with at least a three to six month um, engagement. And that's not necessarily what they'll insist upon, they might, but it's really the best strategy for your book because it's a lot about relationships and things take time. I have a two page spread coming out in the San Francisco magazine in November. Again, my book was published in March. It took that long. I had a two page spread in a couple of um, event and entertainment production magazines, Biz Bash and Smart Meetings that just published in August. So that's, you know, you really need a long runway. Um, I have a 12-month social media plan, and then I sprinkle in um, organic and spontaneous things throughout that. You could do a book launch event. I did both one virtually on the metaverse with about 200 people, seven speakers. We gave away prizes. It was like a three-ring circus. It was phenomenal. Um, if you want the link to that, you can send me an email and I'll send it to you. And then I did an in-person gala. Now, you do not have to do these over the top things. This really has to do with my core business, which is event and entertainment production. So please do not think that if I did it, you should do it unless you're in that business. You can do it in someone's backyard. You can do it at a church, at a community center, at a bookstore. Then the Goodreads giveaway, which is really interesting. You pay to give your book away, <laughs> which sounds counterintuitive. But I think it's about $600. You decide how many books you want to give away. They email their entire database. People sign up to say, hey, I want to um, win the book. And for mine, they, about 5,000 people did. I sent out 30 signed copies to the people that won. And then what happened with those other 5,000, they were emailed saying, sorry, you didn't win, but this book has been placed on your bookshelf. So when they get to it, so it's gotten now three impressions and it's just right there for them to either say, yes, I want to read it or no. So it's a good branding exercise. 
And there's this new app called Bookie Call, which um, slides into your DMs at about 11 every night with an idea for a book based on genres that you've chosen. It's pretty cool. So this is um, a screenshot of the influencers that all agreed to be an influencer for my book. And there's a whole web page for it. And I just put the link in the chat so you can look at it. So if you were, if you agreed to be an influencer of my book, um, that page that you'll see was all the information, the swipe files, the um, social media files, timing, um, and each person was asked by a team, and I used this group called NGNG to do this for me. They were asked, how would you like to support Natasha? Is it with um, a live stream, a podcast, speaking on a stage? You know, they were able to choose. They could choose everything or one or two. It was up to them. And everything was on a spreadsheet so you could hold them accountable, let's say, for the things that they said that they wanted to do. Okay, I got to talk faster. Um, so what is one marketing strategy <laughs> out of what I just talked about that might get you the most action from, do you think? Or one that you think you're definitely going to do? Look, Hannah's going to take one for the team. I can tell. I see her in movement. Good reads. Yeah, it was cool. I'm going to do another one. So I did one in April or May, and I'm going to wait six months and do another one. It's pretty good. Okay. So I think that's about the, the juice of everything. Um, the rest of the stuff is about how you get into my course and what you'll experience, but we're not doing heavy sales here. Here's the program. It is very comprehensive. And if you want to know what it's like, ask Tiffany Yu. She's part of um, Dreamers and Doers. So that's it for me. And I'd love to take questions now. We can probably kick off with Lauren's question about would you need the manuscript done before you hire a literary agent? You don't need it done, but you need a proposal. And it's crazy. People are spending anywhere from 5,000 to 65,000 plus plus on having a professional help them with the pro proposal. And that it's basically a business plan and a pitch deck to show the literary agent where, where you're going to, how they're going to make you money or how you're going to make them money. Let's just be honest. Like we can make it flowery and, and something more than what it is, but really you're proving to them that you have something that a publisher will buy because they're only getting paid a commission if you sign a deal. So you could have an outline done. You could have a synopsis done. You could have one or two chapters. They probably want to see that. You do not have to have the whole manuscript done. Now, back in the day of traditional publishing, the advance was created because a writer wouldn't be able to pay their rent or eat, right, if they didn't have an income. But that's not how people are writing books for the most part, especially us, the, you know, we're entrepreneurs, we have an income and you certainly don't wanna write a book to become wealthy. It's not gonna happen on um, book sales. It will happen with speaking engagements, with courses and coaching and consulting and whatever that is. If you do get very wealthy on a book deal, you're a unicorn, but more power, more power to you. Oh, her baby woke up and started. Okay, so Hannah, I'll let you. Um... Yeah, so Sydney was just wondering if you could touch on professional publishing again, um, just the definition. Of yeah, it's really a work for hire. It's a service. There are so many different um, professional publishers out there now. And really you're gonna just be looking at um, the cost if that's most important to you. They're, um, Hopefully they do excellent work. It'd be great if you were referred to them and you knew somebody that worked with them because like any business, they could do a shoddy job. They could do an amazing job. I actually know publishers that are pretty much good and then they failed one or two people. It just kind of, that's how it works. Same for any business, by the way, traditional hybrid professional. So 
Okay. Awesome. And Anna is wondering if you paid the influencers that you worked with. I didn't. So these are not influencers that are making a living by being influencers. So it's a little bit of a misnomer. They're people that have reach that are within my community that know me and like me and have raised their hand after me asking them if they would do this. Um, I could have considered paying influencers, but based on what my book is about and who the audience is, like micro influencers might've worked. Um, but yeah, I, I did consider it by the way, but I decided not to do that. Awesome, thank you. If anyone has any additional questions, feel free to drop them in the chat. Um, and in the meantime, Natasha, I would love to know, or I think everyone would love to know where they can find you. And if you want to give a little teaser of um, the memoir Sherpa, I'm sure we yeah. keep hearing about it. Yeah. Um, and again, if there's any last questions, drop them in the chat and then we will circle back to them. Okay. So memoirsherpa.com has the information for the, for the program. And then if you want to find out about me and my crazy life, it's official natashamiller.com. And I'm just so thankful to have been able to present to you guys. Um, Dreamers and Doers puts on some really good content. And so for me to be chosen, uh, to be able to present to you is a great honor, but you also have so many op opportunities for great programming. I'm just glad you were here for me. Thank you for being here. You're amazing. We really appreciate you. This is the second time we've been able to feature you and both are just such incredible office. Oh yeah, hours. we should do a shout out to, okay, on, on Dreamers and Doers YouTube channel, there is how to scale and grow your business to seven figures or more. Yes, let me. And then I, and I was invited after that to have that same program or that same masterclass on the NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center. Really? Yeah. That is so amazing. Because of you guys, so. Well, we are so grateful for you and the knowledge you have to share and your willingness to give back. All right. Thank you so much, Natasha. Thank it's such too. a pleasure to have you. Safe travels down south to Huntington Beach. <laughs> um, thank you for investing in us in this way and for sharing your journey and just being so real about the process and just so humble about all the success that you've achieved and all you've accomplished. Such an honor to learn from you. And thank you everyone for tuning in today and participating and asking questions. So great learning alongside you.